This video introduces Online Analytical Processing, or OLAP. A subsequent video will have a demo of OLAP queries in action. Overall, database activity can be divided into two broad classes. One of them, the traditional one, is known as OLTP, or Online Transaction Processing. The other one, the subject of this video, it came about more recently, and it's known as OLAP, or Online Analytical Processing. Online transaction processing is typically characterized by short transactions, both queries and updates, things like updating an account balance in a bank database or logging a page view in a web application. Queries in OLTP databases are generally fairly simple. Find an account balance or find the GPA of a student. They typically touch small portions of the data. And updates in this environment can be frequent. Uh, we might be making airline seat reservations or uh, updating an online shopping cart. OLAP is pretty much the opposite in all respects. In OLAP, we have long transactions, often complex analyses of the data or data mining type operations. Uh, the queries, as I said, can be complex, and especially they often touch large portions of the data rather than small portions as in OLTP. And updates in the OLAP environment tend to be infrequent. In fact, sometimes in the OLAP environment, there are no updates to the data at all. Now, these two uh, are extremes, and really there is a spectrum between those two extremes. Um, we might have a sort of moderate amount of update and uh, queries that touch a moderate portion of the data. But the fact is that database systems traditionally were designed for the first extreme, and then special techniques were developed for the other extreme. So the systems are tuned for the two extremes, and depending on one's workload, one might choose to use uh, different options in a database system. Just a little bit more terminology in the OLAP world. There's a concept called data warehousing. It's, it's really a software architecture. The idea is that often in enterprises or other operations, there are lots of operational sources. So you can think of point of sale, for example. Might have many, many OLTP databases related to an enterprise. And data warehousing is the process of bringing the data from all of those distributed OLTP sources into a single gigantic warehouse where the point then is to do analyses of the data and that would fall into the OLAP camp. Another term you might encounter is decision support systems, also known as DSS. This, this isn't really an exact term. It's generally used to talk about infrastructure for, again, large-scale data analyses. So if you think of a data warehouse where we're bringing in a lot of data from operational sources and that warehouse is tuned for OLAP queries, that would be thought of as a decision support system. And of course, the system is designed to support decisions that are made, uh, again, based on data analysis. Now let's get into some technical details of OLAP. Frequently, applications that are doing online analytical processing are designed based around a star schema. So it's a certain type of relational schema. In a star schema, there's usually one fact table. That will be a typically very large table. It will be updated frequently. Often it's actually append only, so there are only inserts into the fact table. And then there are maybe many dimension tables. Those are updated infrequently and don't tend to be as large. So examples of a fact table might be sales transactions in a sales database or in a university database, maybe students enrolling in courses or in a web application logging the page views. In all of these cases, we can see that the fact table can be very large and can be append only, so inserts only. Examples of dimension tables might be in a sales database, stores, items, and customers, in a uh, college enrollment database, maybe students and courses, uh, in a web application, maybe web pages, users, and advertisers. So you can see that these are uh, generally smaller tables. They're more stable. They're not uh, updated as frequently. You can sort of think of dimension tables as things in the real world, um, and then fact tables as logging things that happened. It's not always divided this way, but it's not a bad approximation. Now, you might be wondering, why is it called a star schema? 
And it's called that because we have the fact table sort of centrally referencing dimension tables around it. So I'll draw the picture. Let's take a particular example and let's look at the sales domain. So we'll have our fact table here, which will be the sales table. And that will uh, log sales transactions. It'll include the store where the sale was made, the item that was sold, the customer, how many were sold, and the price that was paid. And then the other three tables are the dimension tables. So those are um, giving us information about the stores and the items and the customers. So I've drawn a picture of our schema here. We have our central fact table, the sales table. And we can see that the sales table contains these three columns. I've abbreviated them in the picture, the store ID, the item ID, and the customer ID. The store ID values in this column will be foreign key attributes to the primary key of the store table, if you remember our constraints video. So we can think of these as pointers into the store table. We'll be specifically matching uh, store IDs over here. And we'll have, similarly, our item IDs will be foreign keys to the item table. I won't actually point to the values here. And then our uh, customer IDs over here will be pointing to the customer table. So if you look at this uh, squinting, you will see that it is kind of a star schema with the uh, central fact table pointing to the dimension tables around it. And that's where the name comes from. Just a little more terminology. The first three attributes here in the fact table, these three, are what are known as dimension attributes. So those are the attributes that are foreign keys into the dimension tables. Then the remaining attributes, in this case the quantity and the price, are called dependent attributes. So they're, I guess, dependent on the values for the uh, the dimension attributes. And typically, queries will tend to uh, aggregate on the dependent attributes. But we'll see examples of that in a moment. So now that we know what a star schema looks like, let's look at the type of queries that are generally issued over this schema. And they're called OLAP queries. Typically, a query uh, over a star schema will first join some or all of the relations. And when you're joining the sales, the fact table, with the dimension tables, you can almost think of it as expanding the facts in the sales table to include more information about the sales. Since we have the foreign keys, we'll be adding, for example, to uh, the information about a sale more about the store, the city and state of the store. For a sale, uh, the item, we'll be adding the category, brand, and so on. So that's the join process, and the query will join as much as it needs in order to uh, do the rest of its work. It might then filter the data. For example, we might decide that in our query we only care about stores in California or customers in California, or we're only interested in shirts, and so on. So they can filter on the dimension attributes after joining, or could filter on the price or quantity as well. Um, after filtering, there's often a group by and an aggregation. So we might decide that we're interested in uh, figuring out our total sales uh, divided by customer or by item or by state or all of those. And then the aggregation might sum up the sales or it might determine the average price that's sold. We'll be doing a number of this type of query in our demo later on. So if you think about executing queries of this type, they can be quite complex and they can touch large portions of the database. So if we're worried about performance and our data is large, we do have a worry. Um, running this type of query on a gigantic database over a standard database system can be very slow. But over the past uh, decade or so, special indexing techniques have been introduced and special query processing techniques specifically to handle this type of query on star schemas on large databases. And again, by large, just think about the number of sales, for example, in a large retail chain, or the number of web views or even uh, shopping cart additions in a large online vendor. So in all of those applications, people are interested in doing OLAP queries, and they tend to use a system that supports these special techniques. Another component of getting good performance in these systems is the use of materialized views. You might remember that materialized views are useful when we have a workload that consists of lots of queries and not so many updates. And that's exactly the type of workload we have in OLAP. Furthermore, we have many queries that take roughly the same structure. So materialized views are useful in that setting as well. Now let me switch gears and introduce a different way of looking at the data in these OLAP applications with star schemas, and it's what's known as a data cube. Sometimes this is also called multi-dimensional OLAP.
And the basic idea is that when we have data with dimensions, we can think of those dimensions as forming the axes of a cube. It's kind of like an n-dimensional spreadsheet. Now, we can have any number of dimensions, but for the examples I'm going to give, uh, I'm, the best I can draw is up to three dimensions. And that's why people call it a cube, because they know how to draw three dimensions. But again, any number of dimensions are possible in this view of the data. So we have our dimensions forming the axes of our cube, and then the cells of the cube, again, you can think of it sort of like cells of a spreadsheet, are the fact data or the dependent data. It's like in the previous example, that would be our quantity and price. And finally, we have aggregated data on the sides, edges, and corners of, corner of the cube, again, similar to how you might aggregate columns in a spreadsheet. So let's go ahead, and I'll do my best to draw a picture to explain what's going on. So here's my cube with these three axes that I've drawn in black. And I've drawn these dashed lines as well to sort of give you a visual idea of the cube. But I'm going to actually get rid of these dashed lines now just so we don't have too much clutter. So for our sales example, we're sticking with the same example, we have three dimensions and those will label the three axes of our cube. In one dimension we have the stores. In another dimension we have the customers, we'll put that here. And in another dimension, we have the items. And then we can think of the points along these axes as being the different uh, elements in each of those domains or the different tuples in each of those dimension tables. So for example, in the store domain, we'll have you know, store one, uh, store two, store three, and so on. I'm not giving them any fancy names here. And so each of those is a point on that dimension. And similarly, for the items, we'll have item one, item two, item three, and so on. And for the customers along the bottom, we'll have customer one, customer two, customer three, and so on. Now here comes the tricky part, especially for drawing. The idea is that every cell in the cube, so every combination of item, customer, and store, has a cell in the cube. So this will be sort of a free-floating cell here. And this will have, for our schema, the quantity and the price for that item, uh, that customer, and that store. So this might be the floating thing here that's you know item I32, a customer 4, and store 17, something like that. And then floating in there is this cell with the quantity and the price. Now we are assuming that there's just one quantity and price for the combination of those three attributes. And I'll come back to that uh, in a moment, but let's assume that for now. So that's what we have in the whole central area of the cube. So now on the faces, edges, and corner of the cube, we're going to have aggregated data. And there is a pre, there does need to be with each data cube, a predefined aggregate function. So for this one, um, let's say that what we want as our aggregate is the sum of the quantity times the price. So we're going to figure out the total amount that we're making for different combinations of stores, items, and customers. So now let's consider um, a cell on the face of the cube. So I, again, I'm not drawing this very well, but let's assume that this is on the bottom face of the cube. So this is for a particular customer, say customer 10, and a particular store, say store 7. And then, since it's on the bottom of the cube, so we didn't go up this uh, dimension here, it considers all items for customer 10 and store 7. So this will be the aggregate uh, over all items for that particular store and customer. And we'd have similar values on the other faces of the cube. So this face over here, for example, would be for a particular item and customer over all stores. And then on the front face of the cube, if you can imagine that, would be for a particular item and store over all customers. Now let's talk about what's on the edge of the cube. So here we have, say, for store three, we'll have the aggregate value over all um, customers and items in this point for store three. So that will be the total sales that we uh, conducted at store uh, S3. Over here on this edge, we'd have the total for specific customers and over here for specific items. And then finally, we have at the corner of the, t of the um, cube, the full aggregation. So that's going to be, in this case, the sum of the quantity times price for every store, customer, and item. So I'm not a great artist, but I hope this gives you some understanding of how the data cube works. 
So as we saw in the cube, we have one cell in the cube for each combination of store ID, item ID, and customer ID. So if those three together form a key, then it's very straightforward. If the dimension attributes together don't form a key, then we might be pre-aggregating already inside the data cube. So we might decide to already have, say, the sum of quantity times price for each combination of store, item, and customer. Another possibility, and it's done quite commonly, is to add to the fact table the attribute date or even the time. And that can be used to create a key. Typically, we won't have two uh, transactions at exactly the same time. Now, if we do add an attribute here called date, one might wonder, is that a dimension attribute or a dependent attribute? Um, actually, it's really pretty much a dimension attribute because we're, we're going to use it as another dimension in our data cube. But the difference being that we would not have an actual dimension table listing the dates. Now let's move on to a couple other concepts in the OLAP world called drill down and roll up. The idea of drill down is that we may be examining summary data and then we want to get more information, drill down into the details of that data. And actually we can think of that uh, very specifically in a SQL context as follows. Let's suppose that we have this query in SQL, which follows by the way the uh, description of the query I had earlier where we'll do a join and then a selection and then a group by and finally we have an aggregation here. So this query specifically is looking at our total sales broken out by state and brand. Maybe we'll look at that and we'll just say that's not enough detail. I need more information. So to drill down, what we do is add a grouping attribute. So if we added, for example, category, when we add another grouping attribute, that gives us more data in the answer, more detail in our data. Rollup is exactly the opposite. Rollup says we're looking at data and we decide we have too much detail and we want to summarize. And summarizing is simply a matter of removing a group by attribute. So if we took out state, then now we'll only see our data summarized by brand rather than broken out into state and brand. And lastly, I want to introduce some SQL constructs. These are constructs that have been added fairly recently to the SQL standard in order to perform OLAP queries. And we'll be seeing these in our demo. The constructs are called with cube and with rollup, and they're added to the group by clause. When we add with cube to a query with a group by, what happens is that basically we're adding to the result of our query the faces, edges, and corner of the cube uh, using null values for the attributes that we're not constraining. We'll see this clearly in the demo. With rollup is similar to with cube, except it's smaller. It actually is a portion of the data cube. And that makes sense when we have dimensions that are inherently hierarchical. And again, we'll see that in the demo as well. So to conclude, there are two broad types of database activity, online transaction processing, short, simple transactions touching small portions of the data, lots of updating, and OLAP, or online analytical processing, where we have complex queries, long transactions, might touch a large portion of the data, and might not update the data at all. For online analytical processing, or OLAP, we saw that star schemas are frequently used. We saw how to view the data as a data cube. Of course, that can be in any number of dimensions. We just used three for visualization. Um, there are uh, two new constructs in SQL with cube and with rollup. And finally, this type of query can be very stressful on a database system when we have very large databases. So special techniques have been introduced into systems to help perform these queries efficiently.